Today I want to talk about Delta Time. I've seen a couple of very interesting videos recently about Delta Time and I thought they were doing a great job explaining when you should use it, how you should use it, but they don't really dig deep into what exactly is Delta Time and this is something I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Before we can go deep, we first have to make sure to understand what delta time is. And to do that, we have to start with defining clearly what a frame is in a video game. Now hopefully everyone here knows how we create animation in TVs and video games by displaying still image at a fast enough pace that we trick the eyes into thinking that this is an animation. So the delta time is how long we display each of those images on the screen. If you're running at 30 FPS, then you're displaying each image for about 33.3 milliseconds, which would be a delta time of 33 milliseconds. Now in a movie, there's really nothing happening in between each frame. We're just waiting to display the next image. But in a game, we don't have the next frame. We have to calculate it. We have to compute it. And that's what happened in between the frame. That's where your game logic is running. I want to dig a little bit deeper into exactly how this works, but I'm just going to show you one way this could work because every engine is different. Every update is going to happen a little bit differently. But I think the points I'm trying to make are going to stay true no matter which engine you're using or how you're using it or how your update loop is working. So let's start just after the computer rendered the last frame. The Game engine usually will do some kind of maintenance. The first thing that usually happens in a game loop is going to be pooling for inputs and interrupts like key presses. And it's going to take that and put it into a list of currently pressed keys. Then after that, you might have calls to all your update methods for your game, right? So you want to move the character. Maybe you're switching the animation because the character pressed the spacebar or something. After that, it's going to go back to the engine. The engine is going to update the physics, for example, make the character fall down or maybe collide with some boxes, calculate the movement of some entities and stuff. And then it's going to go and pass the update to the animation tree. So if you have a 3D character, it's going to update the bones based on the animation files. Or if you have a 2D sprite, maybe it's going to switch to a different sprite, update the UVs and stuff for your animation to work. And finally, once all this is done, then the engine is going to send all of this to the graphics card and the graphics card is going to run its vertex shader and its uh, fragment shader so that the image is ready to be displayed just in time for the next frame to appear. Now, if you've done some game programming before, you know that for some of those steps, you're going to need the delta time. For example, if you want to move the character, you're going to take its movement speed multiplied by the delta time. And if you've noticed, the delta time is always the same throughout the frame. It doesn't matter which character you're updating. It doesn't matter if it's at the beginning or at the end. It's always going to be the same thing. If you're at 30 FPS, it's going to be 33 milliseconds the whole frame. But how does the computer know how long it's going to take you to render the frame? It hasn't finished calculating it yet. Well, the answer, obviously, is that it doesn't. What it does is use the previous delta time for the current frame that you're rendering. That's totally fine if you're running at a constant frame rate. The previous frame is about the same as the current frame. But if you're making any kind of, you know, visually pleasing game, you're going to know that it's not always true that the frame rate is constant. So this can cause a lot of issues. Let's say, for example, that your game has some kind of lag spike every second frame. For some reason, you're running something really heavy every second frame. So you have one frame that lasts 10 milliseconds, one frame that lasts 100 milliseconds. Now you have to think about what happens to the image displayed to the user, right? Because we're using the delta time from the previous frame, that means that one image is going to be displayed for 10 milliseconds, another image is going to be displayed for 100 milliseconds. But let's say the character in your game is running at a constant speed. Well, for the 10 milliseconds frame, you're going to use the delta time from the previous image where the character was running for 100 milliseconds. And then for the 100 milliseconds image display time, you're going to use the delta time from the previous image that was 10 milliseconds. So for 100 milliseconds, you're going to display the character running for 10 milliseconds. And then for the 10 milliseconds image, you're going to display the character running for 100 milliseconds. 
that can create all sorts of weird staggering effect where you look it looks like your character is shaking or it feels like the character is moving in a way that doesn't seem natural. But that's not all. Let's go back to the order in which the engine updates everything. I mentioned in my example that you could have like the game logic and then the physics update and then the animation update. So let's say your character has a ponytail and you want the bone from the ponytail to be animated with physics. So during the physics update, you take the position of the head and you calculate the forces applied on your ponytail and you move the ponytail to its new position. But wait, you haven't updated the animation yet. That means you did your calculation on the head position from the previous frame. Now, after the physics update, the animation updates, moves the character head, now the ponytail is all stretched and looks weird, is in the wrong position and is shaking all over the place. Thankfully, you know, there's always a couple of tricks you can use. You can try to move the update, you know, make the physics update happen after the animation. But then, you know, you might run into issues where your character goes through the floor because you're moving the fit feet with the animation, but you haven't updated the physics. So you don't know that you're actually going through the floor or the stairs or stuff. And um, this is one of the biggest source of most issues you'll find in even big AAA games. And that's also why often you see um, physic clothing simulation and stuff happening, you know, just with animation or that very limited physic animation. It's because it's very, very hard to get right. <laughs> okay, but what about this constant or physic updates that you see in a lot of game engine? Well, this is useful if you have an exponential function. When is that? Well, the best example I can give you is a camera following the player. For example, the camera is 100 units from the player, so you divide by 2 and you move the camera 50 units. And then the next frame, you divide by 2 again, so you move the camera 25 units. And again, 13 units, and then 6 units, and then so on. Now, if you plot this on a graph, you'll notice it looks incredibly a lot like an exponential function. Actually, it's perfectly an exponential function. But you're going to say, well, I didn't use any exponential, I just divided by a constant number. That's because we're actually linearly interpolating in between each frame to mimic an exponential function. This is nice because exponential functions are kind of expensive. So if you can simplify it by doing linear interpolation, then it's much faster. Now, for a camera, doesn't matter. But do you know what else uses a lot of exponential function? That's right, physics engine. F equal MA, like all the integrals and the derivative, like these have to be calculated by the engine. And if you've got a bunch of physics in your game, this could be like thousands of hundreds of thousands of calculations to do every frame. And if you can get it like one order of magnitude faster, even if it's microseconds or nanoseconds, it's going to make a big difference to your physics engine. So it's really nice to be able to use linear interpolation. But that simplification assumes that your frame rate is constant. If you have a frame rate that's all over the place, then weird things can happen. And it's especially true for these interpolation. Here's the previous example, but instead of having a frame every 33 milliseconds, I put my frame rate all over the place, sometimes 10 milliseconds, sometimes 60 milliseconds. It's random. And you can see, we're not following the same curve at all now. We even sometimes overshoot and have to go back, which is the last thing you want when you're playing a game is to see your camera shaking like crazy. But that's fine. Who said that we need to update a frame at the same rate as the visual? Of course, if you're trying to display something on the screen, kind of a good idea. But the physics update doesn't really care about anything displayed on the screen. It just wants to run some logic on the CPU. So what we do is we put an update inside our update and we run it at a constant frame rate. For example, we look at the delta time from the previous frame, say 66 millisecond, and then in our next update, we do two small updates of 33 milliseconds each. And this depends on what happened in the last frame. So if the last frame was short, then maybe we just do one update, but if the update was especially long, then maybe we do two or three updates. Oh, but that opens a whole bunch of other cans of worm. Because now you have to deal with multiple delta times and you don't know where you are, right? Maybe the last frame took 70 milliseconds, but your constant 
frame rate is 33 milliseconds. Okay, so you can run two updates, but you're at 66 now, but your update is at 70. And now you have to deal with like the real time and the delta time, and they're not always in sync, and they're not always in sync with the uh, constant update. Now, the solution to that is often to kind of keep track of the real time and then interpolate what's happening in the gaps. So you're like, well, we're 10 milliseconds behind, so let me pretend that I'm 10 milliseconds further, calculate that, but then in the next frame, you throw it away and you restart from the actual place you knew where you were. But that requires a lot of changes. Now, there's some engines that have this built in, they can do it for you, but sometimes you kind of have to do it yourself and it can get really complicated. But if you don't do that, then you run into situations where sometimes you'll see the camera move a lot, sometimes move just a little because one frame we did one update and then one frame we did two updates or three updates. There's also the risk that you might fall behind. What if it takes longer to run your constant update than the constant update is, right? Your constant update is 16 milliseconds, but running your constant update takes 30 milliseconds. That means that every frame, you're gonna have to do it more and more, and then you're just gonna go into a loop where everything freezes because you're running like a million update in one frame. There are still many things I could talk about regarding delta time, update issues, lag, interpolation and all that. Uh, it, you know, just when you introduce multi-threading or online latencies and all that, like it becomes a whole different ball game. But I think it's a good point to make the cut today. So that's gonna be it for this week and see you all in my next episode. Bye!